Recently, I played through Halo 3 ODST with the help of a friend, and he enjoyed it, but I went a little insane. The following is a completely inaccurate summary of the campaign from a guy who doesn't even like ODST. Don't trust him. Shut up, Chris. If you enjoy the video, don't forget to like and subscribe. The game begins with a text crawl, informing you that even though this game is called Halo 3 ODST, it's not set during the events of Halo 3, but actually Halo 2, so why didn't they just drop the 3 from the game's title? Anyways, we're introduced to... uh... they never actually say the name of the squad in the game, so I'll just go with The Squad. The squad's name is Alpha 9. Yeah, but they never say that anywhere in-game, unless it's part of some text document I didn't read. You're only saying that because you can't read. Shut up, Chris. We're introduced to the members of the squad and their personality traits. Rookie spends half the game sleeping, even though he was already taking a nap at the beginning. Tough guy is the tough guy. Romeo is... an asshole. Team leader man tells us what we're doing. Ms. Naval Intelligence sends confusing signals because woman. Also, Alan Tudyk is here, but he doesn't really say much in the opening cutscene. Romeo continues acting like an asshole, so team leader man tells him to shut up and nut up, and he complains about using a sniper rifle in close quarters because Romeo has obviously never played a Halo game before. Just in case you weren't fully convinced that Romeo is an asshole, he he smacks the hell out of Rookie with the butt of his sniper rifle and insults him. So Tough Guy toughs him out of the way and we get a good look at everyone's gross, low-poly sausage fingers. Tough Guy lets us know that it's a good time to be the strong silent type, which is a good thing because Rookie literally never says a single word throughout this whole entire campaign, even when it would definitely benefit him to speak up. We close up our pod and drop down into New Mombasa, the city that the Covenant destroy in Halo 2 and Halo 3. Romeo once again continues his tirade of assholiness, and Buck literally orders him to shut the fuck up, so luckily we won't have to listen to him for a while. Ms. Naval Intelligence lets us know that there's a change of plan and that we're not going to be dropping onto the Covenant ship hovering over the city, but doesn't actually let us in on what we're going to be doing instead, and we won't see her again until the end of the game, so I hope you weren't banking on the fact that you'd be pursuing an end goal because everyone is just going to be wandering around doing their own thing for the next four hours. The Covenant carrier jumps into slipspace and causes an EMP that knocks everyone even further off course and we crash land. Six hours later, Rookie wakes up from his landing and we're left to speculate that maybe Rookie never actually left his pod and that he's really just bleeding out from head trauma, and everything that follows is just him hallucinating, because that would make a lot more sense than what we're given, because there's no context. We wander aimlessly through the streets of New Mombasa and make contact with Virgil, the city's AI superintendent that makes us go through a tutorial before we can continue, so I sit and comment on Rookie's wardrobe while I wait for Chris. Also, I think it's hilarious that an orbital drop shock trooper has fingerless gloves instead of a fully concealed suit. Just don't worry about that. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, what happens if your drop pod gets depressurized while you're in space? Your fucking fingers are gonna freeze off. <laughs> we stumble upon Ms. Naval Intelligence's exploded helmet, and Rookie recalls a conversation that he definitely didn't hear because he was asleep the entire time. And then I guess he just starts having psychic visions of events that he missed, because now we're back to six hours previous, immediately after the drop, playing his buck. Why did we have a super intense drop pod cutscene only to cut to a boring city crawl, only to cut back to the action immediately after the drop pod cutscene? Why didn't we just start here? Ms. Naval Intelligence is stuck in her drop pod, so we have to run through the city that we just ran through as Rookie, except this time it's actually light outside so we can see what we're doing. We could have seen what we were doing if those flashlights and of our guns actually worked. Buck finds the drop pod and pries the door open, only to find out that Ms. Naval Intelligence isn't inside. Wait, what? Then why was the door stuck shut again? Did she take the time to close it when she was being attacked? An engineer wanders up and tries to give us her helmet back, because he was keeping it safe for her. But Romeo shows up to save the day and shoots it in the head, which causes it to explode and launch her helmet a crazy distance away, through a window, and into the TV where we find it six hours later. So, you remember in Halo CE when Chief finds a video recorded from the viewpoint of a Marine that wanders into the flood-infested forerunner structure? Why didn't they write this section as Buck losing his helmet to the explosion? That way when Rookie pulls the helmet from the TV, he can check the video record and watch back the events from Buck's point of view, and that would make a lot more sense why we just know what's going on. But I digress. Buck asks Romeo a question, but Romeo is still being an asshole, so unfortunately, Buck gives him permission to speak again. And Romeo tells him that it killed Ms. Naval Intelligence like he witnessed that himself. Except he clearly didn't, because that's not at all what happened. Thanks, Romeo, you dickhead. Romeo asks what we're all thinking, and Buck reaffirms that no one knows what the hell is going on, except for the one character that we won't see again until the end. Cut back to six hours later, again. Yay. At least the jazz is really good. After five more minutes of wandering through dark streets with literally no fighting, we stumble across the head of a crashed drone and have more hallucinations of conversations we definitely didn't hear, and cut to Tough Guy, who crash landed in a nature reserve. We grab a puma and ignore everyone who needs any help so we can just get through this level quickly. As we drive across a bridge, we get to watch the closest thing to a set piece this game has, as the space elevator breaks apart, but we don't stop to admire the view because we're busy ignoring everything to complete the level in under five minutes. Chris crashes the warthog because a random ODST who doesn't even have a name can't be trusted to drive. Who even is Player 2? It's not like they copy the main player model, it just looks like Rookie. But it's not even Rookie, because he's asleep in his drop pod during these events. Player 2 isn't real, remember? So that crash is actually your fault. Tough guy drives off the cliff in a ghost and crashes and dies, and that's the end of the game.
But then there's more. Tough guy prays to the Lord that he doesn't have to do any more flying, and his prayers are answered through an excessive amount of things crashing and exploding. And cut back to the rookie. Hooray! My favorite part. You know, this part could have made sense. The wombat saw Dutch at the beginning of the level, and it could have been inferred that it was keeping an eye on the area until it crashed at the end, which would have given Rookie a good understanding of the events of Uplift Reserve if he took out a video record of the thing's camera. But he doesn't, he just kind of shakes it and imagines a conversation he didn't hear. More walking. We decide to make getting to the next objective more complicated than it needs to be just to spice up the boring sections, so we buddy jump our way up to the second floor instead of just taking the stairs like a normal person. Rookie dicks around with a broken Gauss cannon and starts hallucinating again as it cuts to Alan Tudor who somehow isn't the best character in this game, even though he's usually the best character in anything else he shows up in. Alan asks a marine how to get back into the thick of it, but they're interrupted by a wraith that drops a hubcap on Alan because every game I play always has to have something related to head trauma. I accidentally team kill, which I'm going to chalk up to the brain damage Alan just experienced, and we roll through the streets in a tank, blowing up any inhuman son of a bitch dumb enough to get in our way. We catch back up to Tough Guy and are forced out of our tanks to go to the next section, where we accidentally softlock the game by leaving Tough Guy out of the area, which we didn't fully realize until three minutes later, so we have to restart the entire level. So we roll our way through the streets again and find out that this Halo game doesn't let us do the Halo thing of cramming vehicles into areas that they're not supposed to be, because there's an invisible barrier that prevents us from pushing this ghost through a place that is clearly small enough to fit through. We fight our way through an arbitrary amount of enemies in a firefight arena before being graced the level end, where Alan wants to sit in the corner with a thumb up his ass until someone pops by to pick them up, but Tough Guy wants to blow shit up so he denies him the satisfaction of a prostate massage. Babe, it's 4am. Time for your nighttime walking. Yes, honey. We wander across exploded ordnance, and Rookie finally remembers a conversation that he was actually around to hear. But then we hallucinate some more flashbacks where Tough Guy and Alan Tudyk blow up a bridge. Even though there's two members of the squad on this mission, only player one gets to play as one of them, and the other one is still just some random ODST that doesn't even have a name, who looks identical to the Rookie. Is the Rookie self-inserting into his fan fiction? Is that what's going on here? After blowing up the bridge, we fight through an arbitrary amount of enemies before we're allowed to walk inside of a building and fight more waves of enemies, but in a much smaller area. We take an elevator to an evac point on the roof, but Alan Tudyk tries to block the cops from getting in because I guess he just hates them. We're interrupted by everyone's favorite enemy type from the original trilogy and get dumped out onto the roof, where we wipe away some of the Wicked Witch's goons and I make an observation about our exfiltration vehicle. So I know the reason that the police have a pelican is because they didn't want to make a new vehicle specifically for this game, but isn't that kind of dystopian? The, the police have a big military aerial assault craft. We hop aboard the Pelican, but leave behind all the other cops that were definitely still alive, and then blow them to smithereens, because I guess Tough Guy and Alan Tudyk believe in a really brutal version of ACAB. Knock knock. Who's there? Mombasa Streets. Fuck. Rookie has such a god-tier throwing arm that he somehow manages to skip a chunk of metal across the water. So I guess his real name is Mariana Rivera. I'm gonna be honest with you, I don't really follow sports, so I have no idea who that is. I just looked up who is the best pitcher of all time, and that's what Google told me. We find a bent sniper rifle, which is actually an allegory for what we want to happen to Romeo. Get bent! <gasps> and you know the drill. Cue the hallucinations. Romeo and Buck wander into an abandoned police HQ, and Romeo tells Buck to give up on finding the rookie, which should be a tip-off that he was definitely lying to us earlier about Ms. Naval Intelligence being dead because he's a lazy piece of shit. Just saying. I ain't dead. But we all wish you were, Romeo. The Pelican comes to drop off Tough Guy and Alan Tudyk, but they decide to take too long to hop out and some Banshees attack, and because it's a Halo game, every Pelican has to crash. Even though Buck and Romeo are both on this mission, I'm forced to be Romeo and Chris's rookie self-insert fanfiction OC. We make our way through some copy-pasted balconies before catching up to Tough Guy and Alan Tudyk, where we have to kill an arbitrary amount of Banshees and Phantoms until the game finally decides that the level is over. A Brute Chieftain drops in and slaps the hell out of Romeo with a gravity hammer, but decides to swap to the knifey end of the hammer to finish him off instead of splattering him into a fine paste with the concussion end. Unfortunately, Romeo's sniper rifle is able to take the brunt of the hit and he survives the encounter. If only the swing was a couple inches lower, then we wouldn't have to put up with Romeo any longer. The squad takes the chieftain down and I guess just walk down a few dozen flights of stairs to street level. As long as it was painful to Romeo, I'm happy. Rookie tries to straighten out the sniper rifle for some reason, but he gives up because why did he even try to do that in the first place? What was he gonna do, use it? And now for more padding, I mean walking. This would be a lot more unbearable without the jazz find a biofoam canister, which means, unfortunately, they performed medical aid on Romeo instead of just letting him die. Hallucination time! The squad puts Romeo down for a sec because he's got a punctured lung, so they fill up his chest with foam. I'm no doctor, but I'm pretty sure that's not how you fix that. It's the future, you never know. It's foam, Chris. Future foam. <laughs> Even though he just saved his life, Romeo still acts like an asshole to Buck. Alan Tudyk says the, you're gonna wanna see this, cliche, instead of just describing whatever he wants to show to Buck, so he and Romeo catch back up to the rest of the group. All Alan wanted to show Buck was that there were some parked phantoms that they'd be able to ask the Covenant nicely to 
borrow. See? That's not so hard, I did it in one sentence. Even though the entire squad is here now, save for the rookie, Chris still has to play as rookie self-insert character instead of someone more interesting. We acquisition some banshees, and we fly through some arenas where we kill everything in the area, interrupted by sections where we have to hop out to open doors so that we can get back into the banshees to kill everything else in the next section. After dispatching a scarab, yeah that's right, Halo 3 ODST has a scarab fight and Halo Reach doesn't. We blow up a hive of engineers because Buck really hates them because Romeo lied to him about them killing his one-night stand. Buck abandons the banshee to hop in the phantom, even though they probably could have just kept the banshee attached to the bottom of the phantom, and they head out of New Mombasa. And that's the end of the game, right? Because Dare never told them the actual plan, so there's no reason for them to fly back into the city, right? But somehow Romeo being an asshole triggered a flashback to Buck that somehow equated to, hey, these tunnels that Romeo just talked about are for sure the objective that Dare never told us about, so we should turn around and head there, because for some reason she took six hours to make it there while we were fucking around. When you nut but she wants to keep going. Ms. Naval Intelligence finally activates her tracking beacon to get some help, right as the squad fly back into the city. So even if they didn't know where she was, coming back would have at least led them to her. She asks anyone listening to respond, but I guess the squad didn't respond, and Rookie for sure didn't respond, because he doesn't fucking speak for some reason, so we wander off in her direction. Rookie jumps down an elevator shaft, and we wander through some copy-pasted hallways for a while before catching up with an oddly suspicious cop who's locked out of the lower levels by Virgil. We wander through even more copy-pasted hallways before the cop gets killed by buggers, because I guess they also believe in ACAB? We go through even more copy-pasted hallways and finally catch up to Ms. Naval Intelligence who almost shoots us in the face. So I guess Rookie's real name is Blackburn and or Wrecker. Ms. Naval Intelligence finally lets us know what the fuck our mission is, half an hour before the end of the game. And then we have to follow her through even more copy-pasted hallways. After fighting our way through the bugger hive, we kill some dogs because they were left off their leashes, and meet Virgil, the superintendent engineer hybrid. Ms. Naval Intelligence lets us know that the engineers are slaves who were forced into service under the Covenant, just to make you feel like an asshole for blowing all of them up earlier. But joke's on you, ODST writers. We're homicide idle xenophobes. Buck somehow wandered down into the hive at the exact location he needed to be to catch up with us. Wait, how did Buck catch up to us so quickly? It took us forever to get down there. Time doesn't make sense here. So we regroup with him and wander back through the copy-pasted hallways again. This game isn't even very long and it's still padded like crazy. We take an elevator and Buck and Dare get frisky with each other and Rookie and Virgil just kind of stand awkwardly witnessing the whole thing. Not my boss of streets again. <laughs> <laughs> We take another elevator up to the highway, and Buck and Dare argue with each other for a little while before Virgil steals a garbage truck. Buck lets us know that he likes pre-op trans women, and we steal a puma to drive at excessive speeds along the freeway because what are they gonna do, arrest us? We already blew up all the cops earlier. We take an exit into a firefight arena where we survive an arbitrary amount of waves of enemies before the squad finally arrives to pick us up, and I have some final fun before the game ends. Game's over. <laughs> <laughs> You missed. You missed. God missed. damn it! <laughs> it's so difficult to just not <laughs> aim assist! Just nice to know really Come on. You know what? Let's get out of this. <laughs> what? Go, rookie! Head for the bed! <laughs> What? <laughs> there we go. <laughs> we fly out of the city for a second time, and Romeo acts like an asshole again, but the squad still keeps him alive with more meds. We watch the city get glassed and fly off to somewhere else. One month later, Johnson... Wait, what? Hang on, this timeline doesn't make any sense. In Halo 2, when the Covenant ship jumps into slip space, Johnson is aboard in Amber Clad with Miranda in Chief. Then we get into the fucky timeline stuff that I highlighted in the summary of Halo 3, but this is even weirder. If this is a month after the events of New Mombasa, that means that after the couple of days the Chief was on the ring, the key ship went into slip space somewhere else for more than a month, because Johnson and Miranda were both back on Earth before Chief got back, and this cutscene takes place in orbit around Earth before the events of Halo 3. Anyways, game over. In my head, I thought I saw it on read, but maybe I'm a little dyslex dyslexic, whatever the fuck that was. <laughs> 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 Don't put the outtakes in anywhere. <laughs> oh, I'm absolutely putting these at the end of the video now. Oh, fuck! <laughs>